And here we are for day 86 of 100 Days of Making Comics. I am Gazbot, and this, well, it's day 86, as I said. Uh, day 86 of what? 100 Days of Comics, which is what? Well, that's where I put at least 30 minutes a day aside from work, uh, pleasure, family, unhappiness, <laughs> sloth, famine, disease, sleet, rain, uh, and work on my own project, which is the comic book The Horror A4, which uh, it has a pitch under construction, but is basically about a world where uh, kaiju giant monsters and uh, kyodai, which are giant superheroes, existed, uh, but no one's seen them for like a hundred years. And then suddenly a monster shows up and how the world and the people there deal with it. Uh, and even though it is a big giant monster book, it's more about the people in the world than the giant monster, if that makes sense. So you can see, as I say, I need to polish that down a bit, but there you go. I mean, that's more than you've gotten for the last 80 something episodes. <laughs> so. Today, um, I had a, kind of a weird day um, in that, uh, like, my ho the hours just sort of got away from me. Uh, and, I, and I did work on the horror and everything, but, like, I just feel like I didn't get a lot done today. Um, and I planned on making that time up at the end of the day, but then I ended up uh, spending time with Q and watching TV, which is terrible. I mean, no, obviously it's good, but that didn't help the, you know, make up the work later thing. Um, and actually, in the past, I've kind of try to keep track of what I did throughout the day or the week or whatever and it's helpful to say oh I wasted time doing that or whatever and sometimes you can't account for it it's just like well I spent an hour doing this thing theoretically but I guess I checked my email and then I got a phone call and I had to go to the bathroom and and all of a sudden even though I put an hour in it was really only like 20 minutes that kind of thing happens that's hard to quantify sometimes um, but just for the heck of it I did actually like recount my hours of the day which I'll read off to you in the basic as most basic sense um, I got up at 11:30 in the morning uh, or in the afternoon, depending on your point of view, but considering I went to bed at like 5 in the morning, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, you sleep all day. It's like, well, I don't have to get up for a job. I don't have kids or anything, so I just try to sleep to get eight hours, which I usually don't. I usually get like six or seven, so I don't consider that being lazy. You know, if I go to bed at 5 in the morning and I get up at 11, that's seven hours, you know, so. Uh, but I got up at 11.30 today, uh, and then from 11.30 to 12.30, I ate breakfast, uh, gave some medicine to my cat, uh, watched a TV show and just generally woke up. 12.30, I'm sitting at the computer, ready to work. 12.30 to 1.30, I'm in work mode, answering emails, uh, answering Facebook messages, uh, making, oh, I had to finish uploading my YouTube video last night because I had done it, but I had set it to finish while I was asleep, so then I had to post it to Tumblr and insert the little, you know, click here to start the beginning of the thing. So, uh, doing all that stuff took me about an hour, it took me to 1.30. Um, and, oh, one of the other things I did during that hour was, which I mentioned I needed to do, is I'm doing a Wizard World convention in San Jose uh, later this year, and they had asked for a bio uh, and a headshot and a couple examples of work, and I did that. And that actually ended up taking a lot longer than I thought it would. So I kept putting it off, thinking, oh, man, it'll just take five minutes to just do it. Well, I was kind of right, because it took me more like 15 minutes, because... Uh, I had a bio I had written a while ago that I had to, you know, kind of update. Then I had to find a headshot that was like, you know, a clear picture on my face where I wasn't like flipping somebody off or doing something too terrible. And, uh, but the hardest part, uh, and this ties in, well, I'll get back to this, but, uh, the hardest part was they wanted some examples of my work, uh, that was not of licensed characters unless I had been published. Like, if I was the artist of Spider-Man and that issue would come out, I could use that. But otherwise, you know, no, like, fan art print type stuff. So I had to find stuff that fit that, you know, uh, decree, edict, constraint. Anyway, guidelines is probably the correct word there. I'm sorry, my eye is itching like I have a hair in it, but I don't feel like stopping the camera, so you just get to see this. Um, oh, maybe it's my laser eyes falling out. Like, on camera, I'll be like, yeah, and then I glow. Oh, that'd be... <laughs> I made myself nauseous just thinking of it because I imagine it coming out kind of like like melted bacon, but then it gets in my mouth, and I'm like, my eye, blah, and then I'm like chewing on my eye bacon. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that whole thing took about an hour. So then, 1.30. Now I'm actually working. I'm doing colors on the Earthling uh, comic. And I colored 1.30, 2.30, 3.30, 4.30. Three, three hours straight on Earthling. Um, didn't finish a page because I had to finish up this one panel for a page, which I had mentioned they'd asked for, uh, for a promotional piece, but it was like a big splash. Well, it's not a splash panel, but it was a big panel. It took up like half the page, a lot of detail and stuff. So I finished up the colors on that worked on the next page uh, of that sequence, but nothing actually finished. Um, 
then uh, I decided I was going to take a bike ride. I was going to go to the gym. I was psyching myself to go to the gym, but I hate going to the gym. I do like riding my bike, um, but the, the, the problem is, theoretically, okay, well, ride your bike. That's just, you know, exercise, whatever. Um, and it's true. And mostly when I go to the gym, I do cardio anyway. I do very weight, little weightlifting, so it's not like I'm missing out that much by riding my bike. But if I go to the gym, I'll do, you know, 15 minutes on the elliptical and then like a half hour on the bike and then I'm done. I come home, I either shower or I don't, and it's like 45 minutes done. If I go for a bike ride, it's like a half hour, 40 minutes to the place I'm going. Like, well, I went to the comic store. So it was like, you know, about a half hour right there, half hour right back, that's about an hour. But then I hung out there for a while and talked to some people and like, so it ended up being really long, which was an indulgence. The bike ride in and of itself was an indulgence of time and then the fact that I hung out there for as long as I did was a mistake. And I kind of, sh I shouldn't have done it, but I did, you know. Um, and so that was from 4.30 to 6.45. So instead of 45 minutes in the gym or an hour bike ride to kind of nowhere uh, or even a half hour bike ride, um, it was two hours and 15 minutes, which was an hour of bike riding, give or take, and an hour and 15 minutes of socializing and shopping at the comic store, uh, which is nice and it's stress relieving or whatever, but that's that. So uh, then I went to, I got back, checked my mail, uh, fed the cats, did something else that I can't read, uh, and that was from 6.45 to, oh, took a shower. That's, I took a shower, fed the cats, got the mail, and that was about a uh, half hour. So now it is 7.15, Q's running late from work, normally I'd be eating dinner at this time, she's running late, so I'm like, I'm gonna catch up on some work. From, so from 7.15, 8.30, coloring Earthling again. Uh, didn't finish the page, but got closer, and that was another 45 minutes on Earthling. So then uh, Q gets home, 8.39, we eat some dinner. Uh, up to that point, you know, the bike ride was a little long, but I, you know, figured I could make up some work at the back end. Uh, and then nine o'clock after dinner, well, we, we watched TV during dinner, but then we, wa in case you're curious, we watched The Flash. Uh, then afterwards, we started watching Parks and Rec, the new season, which we are, are catching up on. And Q said she had to do some work. I'm like, yeah, me too. I have to work later too. So we'll watch an episode or two, and then we'll go work. But she, she was like, well, I could just work here. So she has the luxury of she was working on her laptop, you know while we're watching stuff and hanging out and I was kind of like oh I, I thought we were gonna stop and work and I you know I haven't really put in the work I wanted to on, on the earth I'm saying this in my head to the earthling and I have to still do the horror and do my video and everything and it's, it's getting later but I was enjoying watching the show um, and I was enjoying hanging out with her because like I said I've been kind of not hanging out with her that much and even though it's watching TV it's hanging out we talk in between you know it's, it's socializing in a way <laughs> but um so we watched TV for a very long time. We, we just burned through marathon, binge watch, whatever you want to call it, most of this season of Parks and Rec. So watch TV from 9 to 1 a.m. So that's 9, 10, 11, 12, 1. Four hours. Four hours of TV slash socializing. I don't feel bad about the socializing. The TV, I probably didn't need to watch that much. I definitely didn't. But the fact that it was with her, if it was by myself, I wouldn't have. But it was with her, so whatever. Uh, so 1 o'clock... She goes to bed, I, I'm like, okay, back to work. <laughs> so then from 1 to 2 a.m., Color on the Earthling, I did finish up one page, um, which, uh, actually, I'll just go ahead and put it right now. Here's the page I did. Did, 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 did. Bah, 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 bah. So that, that was that page I got done. One less page I have to do before I go to Japan. Uh, so then at 2 a.m., I started working on the horror, and I worked on the horror for about an hour, uh, which brings us to 3 a.m., which is when I started doing video stuff, which I imagine by the time I film this, put it up, edit it, whatever, it's probably going to take me to 4 a.m. Um, so, and that comes into the whole thing of like, there's an hour of video, you know, do I often say it's a half hour, but it really is more like an hour by the time I'm all done uploading and everything. Um, so I worked on the horror, not a productive day. Uh, I worked on the same page 13 that I had done the sort of easy panel yesterday, uh, and I was like, oh, I'm going to do the hard panel. I'm going to do the first one with the bar. Um, but then I realized, well, I never really designed the bar. I mean, I kind of have a brick, you know, square sitting there. Um, so, I, but I remembered I had some reference I had pulled early on, but then I couldn't find the reference because I couldn't, I, it was dumb because it was right there. The reference was in a file folder where it should have been, but I just was like I'm missing it. You know, when you're like looking for your keys and you look on the bed a hundred times and then all of a sudden they're on the bed and you're like, what the crap? There's ghosts. 
Well, there were computer ghosts because that file was labeled Dan's Bar Reference, which is what I needed. And it was in the Horror A4 folder under Reference. And so I'm like, where is it? Why well, can't it? Have... There's... Well, there's Dan's Bar Reference, but where's the bar reference for Dan? Anyway, I eventually found it, went through that a little bit, found some uh, good, I had a lot of good reference actually, so I was, I was happy with the research I had previously done, um, just not my ability to find it, even though it was in the right spot. Um, so then I started working on uh, a design slash perspective drawing. Uh, I did not get very far in the progress, um, but I, I'm kind of, I, I know where I'm going now. And I'll throw up what I did in a minute. It does not look like much. It's, it's barely even, you know, a rough of the bar at this point. But I like the idea that it's sort of a, one of those three, like, like a wall, a wall, and then kind of a flat, almost like a wedge type of building, like front. Um, and then I was put another little crummy building next to it and then kind of have just desolation, just streets and like another fence, you know, like whatever, there's nothing there and whatever used to be there has fallen down or maybe nobody built there. Um, but then I also put a sign on it, like a big neon sign, which I like the idea of Dan owns this bar. It's Dan's place. But it, he didn't build it, you know, he, he got the bar at some point, he rents it, he owns it, whatever. And so I like the idea that there was a sign there that wasn't his sign. Um, so I put kind of like a big neon flashy sign, which doesn't fit in with the vibe of his bar or the town or anything. So clearly it's one of those things like, oh, you know, 50 years ago this was a posh place, but now it's not even remote and it's bizarre that it's still standing. Um, and uh, so I had to say like, Eddie D's, or Eddie B's. Um, but then the E, D, D, Y, or I, I guess, depending on how you spell it, but I did Y, were like knocked off, but you can see like a little shadow where they used to be there. And the only neon letter remaining is the B apostrophe S. And then he, or one of his, you know, clients, uh, clients, customers, his, his beer client, well, it's not beer, it's caffeine, but his, his drink clients, uh, had knocked out the top bubble of the B, so it says D's. So D's for Dan, but it's that, you know, it's just this hodgepodge of anachronistic sign and vandalism that, you know, made it into D's, you know. So I just thought it was kind of a fun touch. Uh, and so I was happy with that, and I was happy with, like, you know, okay, this is what it's going to be, um, and, but I just didn't get very far on it. Anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and put up what I have right this area. Huh, that was that air. Ut, ut. You can't even see it on camera. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? What? It's like this. It's like this. It's... Anyway, um, so getting back to what I did during the day, I have my little itinerary sheet. Um, the Wizard World bio, okay. Went to the comic store. Um, I had actually thought a fun thing to do uh, when I got to the comic store would be to uh, take video of the comics that came out this week. And I, I might do this in a future video. Um, and just sort of not judging other people's art, not not in a nasty way. Well, I guess it would be judging their art, but more in a, a critique way as opposed to, well, you know, this guy can't draw, this girl's terrible. Just sort of film what I'm looking at and then say what I'm thinking as, as I look at the covers as sort of an exercise on what catches the eye, what makes a good cover, what makes a bad cover. Not in a super analytical way, but just in a gut level, you know, this appeals to me. Why? Here's why. That looks bad to me. Why? Here's why. That was kind of my plan, but when I got there, there was an artist signing, which I kind of knew about, but I, I forgot. And they have artist signings at my shop quite a bit. It's elusive comics and games. Um, it, and it's, uh, it, yeah, they're really good at having events and stuff like that, I, which I rarely take advantage of. Um, for a couple reasons. One, I'm not good at scheduling, keeping track of when things are going on and making it a priority. Uh, I, clearly, I mean, I got there and I didn't even know what was going on. Um, the other thing is, I, I and this is weird to admit, but I get... I'm, I'm a very outgoing person. I mean, the way I'm in my videos is not that different from how I am in real life. You know, I'm a, it's a little bit weird because I'm sort of delivering a monologue and I feel the need to be high energy and, 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 you know, amusing and stuff. But I kind of feel that way in real life, too. I think there's just, it's a little more effortless in real life. And, uh, you know, there's a back and forth. I will actually have a conversation with people from time to time. But uh, I, most people will call me an extrovert. I, I don't know that I agree with that, but that's, you know, if you want to go with that classification. Anyway. Uh, however, certain specific weird circumstances, I'm very not an extrovert, or at least I'm not uh, it, with that person. And the, the perfect example is, is this artist today, who I don't know. I didn't really know his work. Uh, wow, I can't remember his name. Uh, I'll find his name and put it in the, the link below. But he is, I believe, a penciler on Teen Titans right now, and he had worked on Superman and a few other things. So he's like a, a big name, big-ish name for DC. I mean, uh, he's not Jim Lee, but, I mean, obviously I didn't know his name, but other people probably know his name, and he works on books that everybody knows. He's certainly a bigger deal than I am. 
Um, uh, but uh, I didn't personally know his work. I don't read those books. So uh, it, it's this weird thing where if I was a fan, if it was like an artist, you know, if it was a uh, Walt Simonson or something, who I'm like, oh, I'm a fan, I wouldn't have any problem going in there and be like, wow, I love your work, and hey, here's this, can I buy a sketch, can I get a signature, whatever the thing, or just have an interaction, get a picture, and then, you know, maybe if it's not too busy, talk a little art stuff, you know, um, or if, if it was, you know, sort of a nobody artist, that like, like more like me, uh, I would also likewise feel like, oh, well, let me go over there, nobody's looking at him, hey, what do you got there, and sh sort of show interest, maybe buy a comic out of, you know, <laughs> support for my fellow artists slash pity, depending on the level of success they're having that day, and again, talk art stuff and talk shop and kind of c connect to them as a peer. Um, so, like, coming at someone as a fan or as a peer, I I I'm comfortable in those roles, but this is a case where I don't feel that I'm, e I'm not a fan, but I'm not a peer, uh, and I'm probably closer to a peer than a fan, but it's still like, I don't know what I would say, and I, I'm not really interested in buying the new issue of Teen Titans, uh, or whatever it was they were selling, um, but I did think, but it is like, and, and I know the owner, and she's always like, you know, you should connect and network and talk, and, and you know, and, and I'm terrible at it for a variety of reasons, and this is one of them, that this is a case where, like, oh, I should probably talk to this guy who's a penciler at DC Comics. Um, not that that's my ultimate ambition, but I'm not one of those people that I would never work for DC. I would absolutely work for DC, or Marvel, or whatever. I would love that. It would look good on my resume. There are characters I like that, as, as a kid, I always wanted to work on. You know, I like working on my own stuff, too, but theoretically, if I worked on one of these books, I'd, I'd be making a decent amount of money, if not a ton of money, where I could just do comic work, and even if it wasn't my own, it would increase my craft and I would love to draw booster gold you know what I mean so like uh, anyway so in theory I should talk to this guy and be like oh this is great stuff and you know I also am an artist and uh, you have any tips for me Do you know anybody you know kind of gently ask about career path stuff or just how he got in that kind of thing but I, I feel like that's I, I don't know how to do that without being a jerk you know what I mean? I feel like, oh man, I wouldn't want somebody me bothering me. Like, oh, how do I get work? Oh, hey, will you look at my art? Like, y you know, I don't know. I can't think of a way to do it. And, and the answer is, oh, well, just go be friendly and genuine. And like, and I can, but it's just, I don't know. And then there's a part of me that's like a holdover from when I was a kid. Like, whatever, I don't, I'm too cool. Like, like you know, like kind of how I used to be about Kevin Smith. I'm from New Jersey and like right where he's from and I'd see him or somebody talk about him and be like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, like I know Kevin Smith, but I actually like his movies. I'm a fan of him, but I had to pretend to be like too cool or, and I was only half pretending. Like there's a part of me that's like, screw Kevin Smith, you know, like, I don't know, I'm, you know, why? Because we're both from New Jersey and he is more successful and or I'm too cool to acknowledge that it's cool that Kevin Smith is in this building that I'm in, or, you know, whatever, I don't know. But it's, I think there's some holdover from that. But also, just the not wanting to appear as this, like, weird, desperate artist guy, y you know, that I've seen at conventions. <laughs> and uh, so, I, I went, to, I, was at the, and I was at the shop for, like, an hour. And, and part of it was, you know, I, I know the people there, I'm friendly with the people there, so I chatted with them a little bit, bought a comic, bought a, a Coke Zero to give myself some caffeine to get home, and I flipped through the previews looking for any cool toys or whatever, so I was doing comic book store stuff, but I also thought, well, if I'm here for an hour, if I'm just running in and running out, I'm going to be like, oh, hey, what are you doing? But, you know, maybe I'll wait till it gets a little slow around his table and, and try to chat with him a little bit, um, but there, when I came in, it was also really unclear who was the artist, because there was like... 10 people at the table, which is not a huge crowd of people, but for a small shop and, a, you know, a small six by six table, that means there's like four people in front, two people on each side, and there were two people behind the table. So, and I wasn't sure if one of the people behind the table was the artist and the other was like an assistant, or if that was just some fan getting too close or what. And they were all talking when I came in, and the, the two people behind the table were standing up. One of them had his back turned, like, talking to people, and I was like, I don't even know who the artist is. And I'm like, well, I'll wait till it dies down. It never died down. For like an hour, that was the situation. The same basic 10 people. I think maybe two left and two more came up. And it was like a group. It wasn't like, you know, people waiting in line for signature. It was like a group of five friends all being like, yeah, we like art. And then other five friends like, we love our Teen Titans. And just talking at them, talking at them, talking at them. Uh, and I, again, I wasn't even clear who the artist was, and that didn't let up for the whole hour. And so, I, and I also thought, like, well, good for him. He's he's popular and he's getting attention. It sucks to sit at a table and have nobody be interested. But then, I, the more I thought about it, I'm like, that actually doesn't seem so great. 
Because there's no way all 10 of those people are buying stuff and keeping them engaged. And theoretically, if I had wanted to go up and get a comic or something like that, it kind of deterred me from it. So it might be kind of like a mixed blessing having that crew there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, and, and I'm kind of putting the blame on his fans and him, and stuff, but, I'm, but I'm not. It's all my weirdness. Because meanwhile, I'm talking to people at the shop. I'm talking to people I don't know at the shop. I'm interjecting in conversations I'm not a part of. I have no problem with that. You know, somebody's talking about something, and I'll just, like, yell over my opinion. So clearly, I'm not a shy person, but I get weird and self-conscious in certain aspects of my life, specifically my art and my comic stuff, where I, I guess I feel vulnerable or whatever, you know, and... Uh, and this was one such uh, situation. And I've been, like I said, I've been to that shop before when there are artists there. And I'm just like, oh, I wish I wasn't here now that they're here, you know. One time I actually did engage and I felt uh, stupid. It was an uh, uh, inker named Mick Gray who's local there. And he was inking Batman at the time. Again, sort of a semi-big deal guy, you know, bigger than me. Not necessarily a household name, but, you know, certainly he's working on Batman as an inker, you know. And uh, it was just a little bit slower. Um, it had been busy, you know, and then it had died down, and it was more the normal thing, where there was like two or three people, and they got their signatures or whatever, and I, I think I may have bought his book and got a signature, which is always a nice, like, excuse to talk to the person or whatever, and, you know, support him, and so I bought the book, got it signed, and I was talking to him and flipping through his pages, he had original art, and I, I wasn't particularly interested in buying it, but they were all, you know, pretty expensive, but then again, it's, you know, current Batman stuff, I, I think he might have been inking over... Greg Capullo or Jim Lee or some artist I knew he was inking over, Andy Kubert, one of those guys. So it was like big deal stuff. Um, and I don't know why, and this is again, this is me attempting to connect on some level other than being a fan but not admitting I'm an artist either. Like sometimes the shop owner, to her credit, will be like, oh, Gaz is an artist too. And I'm like, ah, yeah. What have you done? Nothing, nothing you would know. Do you have any samples? I, no, I. No, you know, like it's, I'm terrible. Um, but uh, so I was flipping through his pages and looking at him, and I don't remember how it came up, but somehow or other, I brought up the the Justice League um, when Keith Giffen and uh, uh, who was the artist on it? Oh my gosh, he's one of my favorite artists, but I'm totally blanking. Well, anyway, uh, they had re it was like the old funny 80s, you know, uh, Justice League International, and they had done a book more recently, like, I can't believe it's not the Justice League, and it was the same creative team got together working on it, and I bought a page of original art from that book, uh, inked and everything from that artist, and I got it for like 75 bucks, 100 bucks, which is really cheap. I mean, that's kind of like low end for like a crappy page of a not big deal comic, but this is, you know, like the famous artist for these groups of people, and it was a weird thing where I had got it like through a website and it like when I tried to buy it, it wouldn't let me buy it. And I had to email back and forth like five times to make it work. So I think that's why I got it cheap because it like the link was broken and I think they probably sold the rest and then this one never was selling. So, you know, I just really lucked out and got this awesome piece of artwork um, that should have been more. But that's all fine and good. But then I'm looking at these and he's selling them for, I don't remember what, 200, 300 plus, you know, big splash pages, whatever, Batman. And, you know, if he gets that, good for him. I'm not criticizing his prices. And, uh, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, oh, I, you know, I got this Justice League page. And I, I'm just trying, oh, Kevin Maguire. Kevin Maguire's the artist. And we're talking about artists. I'm like, oh, yeah, like Kevin Maguire's like, yeah, I'm like, oh, I got a page of his art, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, I got it for like 100 bucks or 75 bucks or whatever page. He's like, I'm like, it was a great deal, yeah. Like, cause like, oh my God, I, I probably wouldn't have bought it if it was like $300 and da, 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 da. And he's like, oh, yeah, hmm. And he was being polite and friendly, totally nice. And as I'm kind of finishing my little two or three sentence explanation of what a great deal I got buying this original art, it occurs to me that he, what I'm doing, if I was him, this is what I would see. Hey, what's going on? Uh, I bought your comic. Sign. Thanks. Oh, you got some original art? I bought original art from a different artist. Yeah, and he charged less than you. I would never pay this much money for any art, especially yours. You're not Kevin McGuire. No, that's not what I'm saying. That is not what I was saying. But that's what I feel like came out of my mouth, you know, or went into his ear. And maybe not. Maybe he's not as, uh, you know, narcissistic or uh, nervous about himself as maybe I would be. But I felt bad about it. And I've had several incidents like that that, kind of reinforce this of idea of I shouldn't engage with people. If I feel uncomfortable or I don't know what I'm going to say, I'm going to say something dumb. Uh, so I should just not get into those situations. Um, so I didn't. I didn't talk to the guy at all. Um, and uh, I'm not even, yeah, I don't even remember his name. Like I said, 
I'll put it in the show notes in case you care. So that was kind of my day. Uh, I got a decent amount of work on the Earthling done, but didn't have a good work day overall. Did a little bit of work on the horror, only an hour, not a very productive hour. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to, this is getting to be a long video again. Man, I keep doing these long, well, I guess I'm getting near the end now. I'm like, I gotta get everything out that I ever wanted to say. Um, back to the Wizard World thing. They wanted, and I've done a bunch of conventions, not a, well, not a ton, but a couple a year for the last couple of years. And usually they'll ask for a bio. They don't normally ask me for pictures or examples of my artwork at all. So I was kind of like, oh, that's cool. They actually want to put it up on their website or put it in the book or whatever. But the caveat of the art samples being non-licensed work only, which I had mentioned before, and so it took me a while to find some stuff, ended up being kind of a big deal thing because I had some stuff I could show, and I, I you know, gave them some comic page stuff that I've been working on for myself and for Kid Switch and for Earthling. Um, but most of what I sell at shows is prints, and most of those prints are Godzilla, Monsters, uh, Ultraman, Monsters, Mazinger Z, a lot of Japanese, older Japanese properties, and a few more modern things like I have a Ninja Turtle and uh, you know stuff like that. Well, you've seen a couple prints if you've watched the other videos. But I couldn't use any of that. Now that's fine, except what I was thinking is the whole point of this little bio is to send people to me that would be interested in what I'm doing. And so what they're going to see is artwork from three books I'm working on, none of which are out, and none of which I'll have at the table. Well, some of them might be out by that point, but I don't know that I'll have copies, you know what I mean? Like, Earthling will be out by then, but it's not really my book. I was just a colorist on it, so I don't think I'm going to have copies there. You know, maybe maybe I'll get one or two, but not where I'm, like, selling them. So it's weird, because what, what should be there is, like, hey, do you want, you know, some monster prints? Do you want some robot prints? Go see this guy, you know? And, and I said I did sketches, too, but so... Uh, and Q had a similar thing, too, because she does Perler Beat art, and most of her stuff is like, oh, Mega Man, or Final Fantasy, or Dragon Ball, and couldn't use any of that stuff. So it's like, it's hard to market yourself when you're doing that. Now, I'm not crying foul, because why should we be able to market ourselves as like, oh, I drew Spider-Man, come see me. I don't own Spider-Man, I'm not working for Marvel. And it reminds me of stuff Scott Circlin had talked about in his videos about trying to get away from licensed work for various reasons and I've thought similar things he's I guess he's thought about it a while ago and he has a lot more original content than I do I've been thinking it more recently because I've been doing shows and originally it was like oh I'm doing shows I need stuff to sell and I'm just making stuff and now I'm like well what am I really selling they you know getting into like phase two of like okay well I, I make enough money that I cover my table make a little profit but is do I want people to know who I am or do, do I just want to be known as the guy that has, you know, some Ultraman prints or a Doctor Who print or whatever, you know, which is a lot of people do that and whatever. I mean, I know people that, not well, but I mean, I know of people in the area that like they make a living selling these prints and like good for them. It's better than working at Walmart, but I don't know that I want to be that person. Um, and again, not in a judgment way, but like it's kind of fun to do once in a while, but if that was like my full-time job, I might as well be doing client work almost. I mean, it's, I mean, I guess it's slightly better than client work, but here, well, here's the thing. Most of the licensed properties I have aren't really the hot popular thing of the moment. Like I do have a Doctor Who print and a few others, but most of it, like I said, is like, oh, here's some Godzilla monsters from the 70s and 80s. Uh, they're not the hot properties right now, you know, like Mazinger Z, you know, the anime from Japan that was briefly over here in the 80s for like one season. My Bionic 6 print, nobody wants, you know, so I, I was kind of just doing what I wanted to do. And it was fan art that I was a fan of these things and I felt like drawing it. And then I was like, oh, might as well make a print since I drew it. But to be successful at it, I'd have to be like, okay, let me make sure to do a Deadpool. Let me make sure to do a Sons of Anarchy. Let me make sure to do a Walking Dead. Let me, let me do a Game of Thrones mashed up with like Ghostbusters. And it, that's when it becomes client work in my mind, where I'm just chasing the trends and trying to do what's popular and figure out what's going to sell big at these shows. It's different when I went, I did a show called uh, Super Robots and Giant Monsters which was great because I had all this Godzilla stuff, all this, you know, old mecha stuff that I had done just because I wanted to. And here's a show that caters to the people that like that stuff. So that didn't feel like client work, and that's great. Um, but even if I could find that kind of show all the time, it does come back to the whole, if I don't own this stuff, I'm not getting uh, anything out there of myself. My name isn't growing. I'm just, you know, making money. Which, again, I'm not complaining about making money doing art, but... Uh, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm not doing that anymore, but I definitely 
want to get more at least 50-50 original and licensed so that if I do have a show where they want examples of unlicensed work I will have some choice pieces as opposed to just finding what I can uh, and if they do bring the hammer down legally and say you can't do this anymore I won't be ruined at shows and you know and really I want to be selling comics anyway but as of now I don't have any comics to show so you know and, and from friends I know that sell comics, they'll say, yeah, I bring the comics, but I make the money on the prints and the t-shirts, even fans of their comics, because, you know, if you sell a comic for three bucks, maybe you make a dollar profit or whatever, so you sell, you know, a hundred of them, you make a hundred dollars, but you sell, like, three prints, that, that, depending on how much you charge, that could be 30, 60 bucks, sell a few t-shirts, you know, it's, it's kind of, unfortunately, it's kind of the equivalent of licensing for Marvel, where they don't make money on the Spider-Man book, but then the toys and the movie and everything else. Um, but this is a bit of a ramble and just a reason, another reason why it's good to not focus only on licensed work, especially if you don't have the license for it. So, uh, I've gone on long enough. I'm going to go ahead and call this a day, and the day I'm going to call it is 86. And that means... There's 14 more left! <laughs>